The idea that even foxes could pose a threat to humans in Australia might seem like a joke, but there's nothing funny about it. Instances of animal attacks are on the rise. In the southern outskirts of Melbourne, the same aggressive fox has bitten multiple people over a span of a few weeks just because it wanted to. Oh, you f***ing Foxes in Australia aren't just causing problems by attacking humans, they're also wreaking havoc on unique Australian wildlife and plundering farms. It's no surprise that Australians decided to take action and declared war on the foxes. How did foxes even end up in Australia? It all started as usual with humans. Foxes arrived in New South Wales with European colonizers in 1845, and they weren't there for practical purposes like sheep or cows. Unlike typical farm animals, the sole reason for bringing foxes was to offer the colonists a familiar pastime hunting. Fox hunting in English tradition led to the release of many foxes around Melbourne. Just two decades after their introduction, foxes were labeled as pests in Victoria. In the span of a century, foxes made their way across mainland Australia and are now widespread, closely linked to the distribution of rabbits. And it didn't stop with introducing foxes. People also brought rabbits and hares to Australia. Foxes must have been thrilled that humans had served up a buffet for them. And with rabbits still thriving in Australia, they're fueling the fox population to this day. Recent estimates put the fox population in Australia at about 1.7 million covering 80% of the mainland and 50 Australian islands. While foxes are scarce in northern Australia and Tasmania, the rest of the land doesn't have enough predators to hunt them. Even though foxes are mostly killed by humans or drought, it doesn't do much to bring down their numbers. Foxes thrive mostly in mainland areas with moderate climates, like forests and farms, and close to cities where they can find plenty of food and shelter. According to the Victorian state government, Melbourne is estimated to have up to 16 foxes per 250 acres. And they don't just mind their own business. The economic damage caused by foxes in Australia is estimated at around $227.5 million a year. Foxes are considered one of the most destructive invasive species on the continent. It's difficult to quantify and put into dollars the impact foxes have on other species. Foxes pose a threat to at least 14 species of birds, 48 species of mammals, 12 species of reptiles, and 2 species of amphibians. Foxes view nearly any animal weighing up to 12 pounds as potential prey. Approximately one fox eats about 14 ounces of food nightly, which makes up around 330 pounds of food in a year. Foxes can kill numerous mammals, reptiles, birds, and insects in a single night, despite only eating a small portion of the kill every year. And that's just from one fox. There are quite a lot of them. Scientists have calculated that Australian foxes alone kill around 300 million native animals annually. When you factor in animals from other regions, the numbers become even more alarming. This includes 88 million reptiles, 111 million birds, and 368 million mammals that fall victim to fox predation each year. To be fair, foxes aren't the bloodthirsty villains they might seem. Yes, they kill, but not just for the sake of it. Foxes have a habit of storing excess food for later. It's their survival strategy. This usually means hiding the food in a little hole and covering it with soil or other debris. In times of poor harvests, whether due to bad weather or unsuccessful hunting from injuries, foxes fall back on their stash. The catch is that in building up this stash, foxes end up causing harm to many defenseless native species. However, there's one silver lining to this situation. Foxes eagerly eat other invasive animals. They consume 259 million of them annually, primarily targeting house mice and rabbits. Livestock are also on their menu, but we'll talk about that later. There's also an opinion, supported not just by everyday folks, but also by scientists in their research, that foxes are instrumental in managing the population of Australian feral cats, an invasive species causing significant harm to local ecosystems. Remove foxes from the equation and cats would lose a major competitor and expand uncontrollably. By the way, cats are practically everywhere in the country, covering more than 99.9% .9 of the territory, including islands. Alas, this doesn't change the way foxes are viewed. They're believed to have played a significant role in the extinction of many native land species over the past 130 years, putting at risk creatures like the orange-bellied parrot, spotted quail thrush, Gilbert's potteroo, certain petrel species, and the western swamp tortoise, among others. All these animals are on the brink of complete extinction. On Granite Island in South Australia, foxes have all but wiped out the local penguin population. Yes, there are penguins in Australia, for now. Their numbers were already low, and when foxes killed nine birds in a couple weeks, 
the population plummeted to just 12. Without human intervention, the foxes would have remorselessly finished off the remaining penguins. Holding foxes responsible for the extinction of the entire species is supported by evidence. The expansion of foxes across southern Australia in the late 1800s and early 1900s aligns with the disappearance of various species like the tongs, the greater bilby, the numbat, the bridled nail tail wallaby, and even the quokka. Many of these species have only managed to survive on islands or in mainland areas where there are too few or no foxes. This is the predator you can't outsmart by climbing a tree. For a bit, scientists believed tree-dwelling animals were secure, but later it was recorded that foxes were scaling trees to hunt baby koalas and other unsuspecting creatures. Picture the surprise of someone spotting a fox in a tree around 13 feet above the ground. Even though there weren't any active hunting scenes, foxes were seen sniffing the surroundings, tracking scents of other animals in the trees. Clearly, it was about hunting, not just a whimsical desire to climb a higher tree. In the end, it's clear that no animal can consider itself safe if it falls within the fox's dinner plans. It seems things are going to take a turn for the worse. Recently, scientists compared city-dwelling foxes with their wild counterparts. They discovered that the urban foxes are not just heavier, but larger. Not because they're fatter, but because their skeletons are also different. Do you realize what this means? Foxes, already voracious predators, could potentially grow even larger, making them even more menacing. Would there be any native species left in Australia at all? Given that foxes played a significant role in the extinction of 14 out of the 34 species lost in Australia since 1788, the fate of the others seems pretty bleak. Now turning our attention back to the significant claims against foxes, particularly their assaults on farms. The damage to the Australian agricultural sector reaches a staggering $28 million each year. Sheep farmers are hit the hardest, and for a good reason. Just one fox can sweep away more than a week's earnings by slaughtering up to 12 lambs in a single night. Things seem to be getting worse, almost as if foxes have an insatiable appetite that keeps growing. Moreover, they're incredibly cunning. It's not possible to eradicate all foxes from a specific farm, because even if one group is eliminated, others will quickly move in to fill the void within a week or so farmers will be back to square one. I'm sure farmers are thrilled with the brilliant idea from colonizers two centuries ago to introduce foxes for hunting. It's known that foxes may kill lambs and goats. Fox predation on healthy, viable lambs is generally less than 5%. However, this varies between properties. Certain foxes can cause high stock losses. Foxes are noted for surplus killing. It's their strategy, but that doesn't make farmers feel any better. Foxes typically go for the throat when biting lambs and goats, occasionally opting for the neck from behind, although this takes multiple bites. Due to their limited size and strength, foxes can't subdue and immobilize fully grown animals or crush bones, forcing them to target younger animals and bite them repeatedly. Foxes are occasionally found bringing small carcasses into their burrows to feed their young, shedding light on the mysterious disappearances of poultry, lambs, and other small prey from the farm. All of this comes at a considerable cost. For instance, sheep farming losses amount to around $17.5 million per year. While this estimate might be slightly outdated due to recent increases in lamb prices, it's clear that fox predation can lead to a loss of anywhere between 4 and 30% of lambs, which is quite significant. The majority of fox attacks happen within the initial 24 hours of their victims' lives. As the second lamb is born and the firstborn stays close to its mother, vulnerable and bleeding, any fox can swiftly seize the opportunity. Heartbreaking, isn't it? But it doesn't compare to the fate of birds. When a fox sees, say, free-ranging chickens in the coop, that's like an all-you-can-eat buffet. It won't settle for taking down just one bird. No, all of them will be killed. There will either be a heap of carcasses or just a load of feathers left. Usually, a fox will grab one chicken, carry it to its den, and then come back for more. Yet, when the fox finds itself in an enclosed area teeming with potential prey, it might kill multiple animals at the same time. In certain cases, foxes have been documented slaughtering entire chicken coops. In Norfolk, a fox killed about 40 of 200 free-ranging hens. When the farmer went to feed the hens, he found the whole place littered with carcasses. There have been instances where a single fox wiped out 87 chickens out of a flock of 100. The predator only managed to carry away three, leaving the rest behind. Imagine, that's just one fox. Now picture what several million of them could do. Of course, Australian farmers need to address the fox issue. While shooting seems like the most straightforward approach, it's not very effective. 
typically done at night from a car with a rifle and spotlight, its success hinges on the shooter's accuracy and the caution of the foxes. However, it's not a good option for widespread or long-term population control. Moreover, it mainly targets young, careless foxes, which doesn't significantly reduce their impact on lambs or wildlife. Nonetheless, shooting foxes is a widespread practice embraced by many, including government pest control agencies, landowners, and licensed professional or experienced shooters. Perhaps that's why there's been a notable surge in stolen firearms in recent years. People don't seem to bother about proper storage, maybe because guns are needed too often? The foxes are coming. Naturally, you can't just grab a rifle or a firearm and start hunting foxes. There are specific guidelines on how to shoot them in a humane way. It's believed that shooting should only be done by trained marksmen who know where to aim for an instant, humane kill. Without this expertise, you won't be granted a license. Age isn't a barrier if you have the right skills. You can still get a license. Almost any age, that is. Take the daughter of an Australian farmer who obtained her shooting license at the age of 13. Since then, she's been actively involved in pest hunting, especially foxes, alongside her father. In 2015, they even set a record by shooting 194 predators that posed a threat to their farm sheep. And this is not a unique case. Australian teenagers from rural regions are familiar with fox hunting, picking up the skills naturally in the process. There's even a specific junior shooting license available, obtainable from the age of 12. Just think, what were you up to at 12? Meanwhile, Australian teenagers are fighting foxes. Typically, it's something they learn from their parents, but if the tale of that farmer's daughter holds true, the urge to defend defenseless lambs emerges in anyone who sees a fox attack. Shooting is commonly done at night from a car using a spotlight to illuminate the prey. Certain shooters use whistles that mimic artificial rabbit sounds to attract the animals. <laughs> Nevertheless, shooting from a moving car is against the rules, as it compromises accuracy and humane practices. There's a more interesting rule. If you spot a fox using a spotlight or a whistle, never take a shot unless you're certain it'll be fatal. Foxes learn quickly, and if the light or sound is followed by something frightening, they won't fall for that trick again. And all farmers know it. Shooting to kill is in their best interest, because farmers are saving their farms. In Australia, guns and farmers go hand in hand. They're the primary buyers and users. There are even specific regulations for using firearms on farms. This is despite Australia being hailed for its stringent gun control laws. It's a bit ironic considering the numerous thefts. Oh well. If you're an Australian farmer, having a firearm is easy. Get a license and you're ready to protect your farm from foxes. In Australia, there's a stat suggesting one gun for every seven people. And farmers, in particular, have access to a distinct category of firearms. So you could say farmers hold a sort of elite status when it comes to guns. Farmers don't stand alone in this battle. State services actively shoot foxes, and authorities run campaigns urging hunters and farmers to help manage the pests. It's not like a shoot two foxes and get a rabbit as a gift deal. They offer cash rewards. In under a year, fox hunters in Victoria pocketed a million dollars by eliminating 100,000 pests. The authorities contributed a total of $4 million to the prize fund, successfully killing 400,000 foxes over three years. Although the reward was only $10 per fox, it made a significant impact considering the massive number of foxes. Turns out there are special clubs dedicated to traditional fox hunting that still exist in Australia, echoing the practices that marked the beginning of fox dominance on the continent. Unlike the UK, where such pastimes are prohibited, Australians, regardless of traditions, persist in fox shooting. Why not? Every week during winter, members of hunting clubs take to horseback with hound dogs for fox hunting. While this tradition faces opposition, mainly arguing that using dogs for fox killing is inhumane, it persists among the wealthy on private lands, with advocates claiming there's nothing morally wrong with it, though it does sound quite controversial. What if instead of killing foxes, we deter them from farms? People have devised different gadgets for this purpose. For instance, there's a light that flashes intermittently to frighten foxes away. They assume there's a person near the light and steer clear. What about traps? Can't we just catch foxes that way? Well, theoretically, yes, but it's a lot more time-consuming, labor-intensive, expensive, and to be frank, not as effective in reducing the population. Success largely hinges on the trapper's skill, and true experts are few. Traps are typically used in urban areas where poison is restricted and shooting is prohibited. And foxes, as you might remember, are pretty clever. Take Rambo, for instance, a fox that managed to outsmart camera traps for over four years, avoiding all attempts to be caught or poisoned. 
Considering how many animals a single fox devours in a year, just imagine the havoc Rambo wreaked in four years. All in all, traps seem like a rather questionable idea. Also, foxes are quite wary of traps. Take some effort to lure a fox in and nobody's immune to making mistakes. Can you really guarantee that a threatened species won't accidentally end up in a fox trap? I seriously doubt it. Now what about using poisons? There are only three legal types and you're supposed to place them as bait at specific distances from one another. Some even suggest burying them to avoid unintended consumption by other creatures or spreading via ants. And you can't just casually sprinkle poison on your land, you've got to give your neighbors a heads up at least 72 hours in advance and slap warning signs around. Let's just hope foxes can't read. Now talking about pest killing poison, one that gets quite the attention is the so-called compound 1080, or sodium fluoroacetate. For the chemistry enthusiasts out there, here's what its formula looks like. Compound 1080 is a odorless, tasteless white powder with a special dye added to identify the toxin. The poison is added to fresh, dried, or processed meat baits, which are then either spread on the ground by hand or scattered from a helicopter or airplane. Foxes happen to be one of the species most affected by compound 1080, which is a good thing. There's a lower chance of accidentally poisoning unintended targets. However, if a dog consumes the poison, the chances of a fatal outcome are quite high. Herbivores face a slightly lower risk, while birds and reptiles don't have much to worry about. Compound 1080, originally synthesized in 1896 and patented in Germany in 1927 as a pesticide, found its early use in rabbit control programs in Australia by the early 1950s. Since then, it's been a trusted tool against rabbits, foxes, wild dogs, and pigs. In 2011, over 3,750 baits with Compound 1080 were distributed across 520 properties, covering more than 120,000 acres in Tasmania marking the world's largest attempt at invasive fox eradication. And although this poison is effective against foxes, many locals have complained about this method of fox control and have even created petitions banning its use. Beyond poisons, there's also carbon monoxide, but you've got to find a fox den to make it work. Fumigating the den is a good option for localized fox problems, for example, when there's a den right on the farm. To answer your question straight up, using carbon monoxide seems humane as long as there's a sufficient amount to ensure a swift end. Still, it does sound a bit harsh. A kinder approach would be to teach foxes that dining on farmed animals leaves a bad taste, even making them feel queasy afterward. A study published in a scientific journal revealed that foxes can be taught to link nausea with a specific food source. They experimented with chicken baits containing a substance causing vomiting, and after the first upset stomach, bait consumption dropped by 30%. However, this might not stop foxes from preying on endemic species. But wait, we're in Australia. Where are the fences? Australians thought about that too, but they soon realized that regular fences wouldn't help against foxes. Foxes are smart. They can jump them, climb over them, squeeze through tiny holes, or even resort to digging. These custom fences don't come cheap. They demand constant and pricey maintenance. That's why only high-value livestock gets the protection of such fences. It's not like they're putting up enormous fences all over the country. Farmers are commonly advised to tackle foxes proactively before they become a nuisance. Otherwise, there will be an endless war that's too difficult to win. The idea is to join forces with neighbors and employ any affordable and legal methods available, whether it's shooting, traps, poisons, even the scarecrows. Yep, there's another gadget in town, and it's nothing like a pumpkin-headed human-like figure. This is more like an advanced version of the bright light flashing device. Armed with robust signal lights, it wards off foxes up to 650 feet away in the dark. As foxes approach, motion sensors pick up their body heat, setting off powerful ultrasound and bright white flashes. The scarecrow can also throw in some white and blue flashes for a simulated up and down motion, leaving foxes totally confused. Rumor has it that scarecrows are getting a tech boost with artificial intelligence, enabling them to tell animals apart and scare off only the unwanted ones. Believe it or not, these things turn out to be great at deterring dingoes. And some people, seriously, don't you think they're creepy? Another Australian ingenious technology is the laser scarecrow. It was originally designed to shoo birds away from blueberry crops, but who knows, maybe it could work its magic on foxes too. This scarecrow simply turns in the right direction and shines a green laser at the birds. It's harmless, but it helps scare birds away.
What else can help in the fight against foxes? Guard animals. Not just dogs, but even alpacas. They use these fluffy guardians to keep foxes away from sheep and goats in various countries, Australia included. But don't think you can just get a dog or alpaca and expect the problem to vanish. It's a game of multiple strategies. This approach is more effective in smaller areas, or you might find yourself needing a whole bunch of alpacas. Now, when it comes to protecting animals, dogs are the classic choice. For millennia, farmers have used dogs to keep their livestock safe from predators. The earliest records go back 9,000 years, right in southern Greece. However, raising a guard dog isn't the simplest task. Puppies are brought up in close contact with livestock and form strong bonds with them. As they mature, they essentially become integral members of the pack or herd, ensuring constant protection. It sounds reasonable, but oddly enough, this method of protecting livestock is quite uncommon in Australia. Perhaps it's because the government doesn't actively support or encourage the breeding of guard dogs. See you later.